everybody. Welcome into the Cubs Weekly Podcast presented by Wintrust, proud legacy partner of the Chicago Cubs and exclusive home of Cubs checking. Open online today at wintrust.com slash Cubs Weekly. We have a great podcast, a packed podcast for you this week. A lot of Field of Dreams talk. Uh, Andy and I just got back. So that was pretty awesome. Actually, this is a perfect segue. Uh, Andy Martinez is on the pod. I'm Tony and Jackie <laughs> here. Uh, probably should have done that a little bit better, but whatever. A lot of Field of Dreams talk. We're, we're running on a little bit low sleep count. Um, honestly, I'm still kind of buzzing. I don't know about you, Andy, but like I'm still wearing my baseball writer shirt. Like I, I just feel like it was such a cool experience that the, the lack of sleep, you know, kind of made up for it. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was like great all around. So we're like, we, we got a lot of field of dreams talk interview with the groundskeeper main takeaway from the event. Uh, and then the second half of this pod, we're going to do a little bit of a quick off season preview. Andy and I are going to talk about a little bit what we've heard from Jed Hoyer and Tom Ricketts recently. And then we're actually going to hear a little bit up from Jed Hoyer himself, an exclusive interview with, marquee sports network last week so let's get right into it right now andy uh the big one obviously field of dreams one word you would use to describe and sum up your experience there uh corny corntacular <laughs> uh cornographic i uh, whatever you want to use i mean it's it, it was fantastic the celebration of baseball corn america i mean it was just like it just felt authentic and and like you know like a true uh homage to to baseball and what makes it great right like you know uh, i think you and i or at least i did and i'm sure many people did like how can you outdo last year and, and i think it lived up to last year's you know the first year standards uh it was it was a phenomenal still seeing the players walk out seeing ken griffey jr and ken griffey senior walk out uh that was that was phenomenal uh, it was just it was just fantastic and, and you know i'd never been to to the field of dream site and you know, I, I kind of went in thinking like, it's going to be really cool, but you know, like it's just a baseball field. Like well, how special can it be? And you walk in and it's like, man, like this, like you, you get chills for sure. And getting to play catch uh, or getting to have a catch, uh, whatever you, whatever terminology you want to use. Uh, it was, it was just so, it was just so great and, and a great experience. Uh, what's, what's your one word, Tony? Yeah, you know, I thought a lot about it. I'm, I'm just going to have to say indescribable because I, yeah. I don't, I, that's probably a bit of a cop out to the one <laughs> word you use to describe it, but there's no one word that sums up. I think like the dictionary definition of awesome, like inspiring yeah. awe. Uh, but uh, you know, nowadays everybody says awesome about everything. Like right. that was an awesome player. That was an awesome moment or, you know, awesome. Great. Thanks. Like, or you look awesome just, with your baseball writer shirt. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I know. But like, I feel like that doesn't, it, it's taken a little bit of meaning out of the words. So I feel like indescribable is what I've come back to because everything you said, you hit the nail on the head. And I, I will remember this day for the rest of my life. I feel like just being there and seeing all of that and, there was such a buzz about it. And, and I know Andy, you and I were talking with Scott Shagnon and, and Kyle and Jackie from our social team too, just like what this experience was like and, and how it compares to other, other experiences that I've covered. And like, honestly, I would probably rank it up there in terms of buzz and everything else, maybe like just below the world series in 16 and, and just that whole fall, right? Like that was incredible. Yeah. The DS and CS and everything and being out there for so many of those games, but like this just had a level of buzz. I mean, to, to know that we're in the same ballpark as, as the Griffies and so many Hall of Famers and, you know, David Ortiz and Alex Rodriguez are there and, you know, all the Cubs Hall of Famers and, and Frank Thomas was there and Johnny Bench was there and like all the, the you know, it was like baseball celebrities were just out yeah. all across the place. And there's less than 8,000 people total in the venue. And it felt surreal. And I'm, I kept looking, I found myself during the game which went super quick, by the way, but I found myself just looking out at the corn and the, the seeing Ian Happ in left field and the corn behind him as the sun was setting. And it just didn't feel real. I, I don't I don't know. I know I have to use words for a living and, and talking and writing, but I can't come <laughs> up with words for it. So like yeah. it was it was really just, you know, nuts. And I don't know. I, I mean, this next question too, Andy, I'll ask you, I, I, had, a tr I had trouble with, but like what was your favorite part like what do you think you will remember the most that you'll tell people when you got back from Iowa here that like this is the one the first thing you would want to tell people about 
Yeah, it, that's that, again, like this, that's another really hard question. I think, you know, my gut tells me like it's the first time I've ever covered a major league baseball game and brought a glove and a ball and, you know, was throwing and, yeah. uh, you know, I was joking with, with Cubs PR, you know, we got to provide injury updates that, uh, you know, we were playing catch, you know, like, like when pitchers are rehabbing, it's like, you know, so-and-so played catch today. You know, we were playing catch today. Before From about 120 feet, flat ground. Yeah, though. yeah, flat ground. Yeah. Although sometimes in the outfield, it's a little hilly. So it's a little, right. it mimics the pitching mound a little bit, but yeah, I mean, it was uh, like, it's, it, you felt like a kid, right? Like, you know, whether we were, when we played catch briefly uh, before the game or, or after the game with the lights on and, and, you know, it, it just felt like you were in the movie and, you know, any second, you know, shoeless Joe Jackson would come out of the corn socks and, uh, and, and, you know, wait, expect you to throw a ball to him or something. You know, it, it was just fantastic. Uh, the Griffey's coming out, you know, Ken Griffey Jr. is one of my favorite players growing up, probably one of my top two or three favorite players growing up. So to see him, I'd never seen him in person uh, to see him come out of the corn socks. I had no idea he was going to be there. That was really, really cool. I got goosebumps when I saw him. Uh, yeah, it, it was just, it was just fantastic. You know, the, the all around experience. Yeah, really. I mean, I think that's probably the moment too. And and I remember like sitting next to you and you saying that you had chills when the Griffies came out of the corn and I, that was just so well done. I mean, the, the music yeah. playing, but in a way there was like this hush that fell over the crowd yeah. as, as the Griffies were like, you want to have a catch. And, and then, you know, these, these other parents and kids come out and play catch and, and then all the, the both teams coming out at first, I was like, oh, is this the Cubs first or is this just the Reds first? And it was like, no, it was both. Oh, no, there's yeah. a bunch of Hall of Famers in there, too. And like it was I, I I'm i actually getting chills a little bit, like just yeah. again, like I think that was my favorite part of the so-called like event and game and everything. Like there was, a, you know, many cool aspects. Um, personally, like you said, I think just playing catch there was incredible and you know walking through the corn several times and at the end of the night you know actually we we didn't just play catch on flat mound you and i both got off the mound a little bit yeah, at the movie yeah that's right. field <laughs> before we were leaving um you know through a few pitches both both caught a little bit uh because you found like that cool old school catcher's glove um at a thrift store out there so like but yeah that was just that was just a lot of fun to be a part of it and, and that's what kind of stood out to me is I felt like we were a little bit of a part of it which yeah you know obviously we didn't play in the field and, and anything else <laughs> but like just the way I feel I think all fans did and, and from hearing other other conversations and seeing the way people interacted it, it did feel like everybody was a part of it because there was a moment where the Cubs got done taking their team photo and then they go out to the movie site field and a bunch of them they were able to just do whatever and there were fans yeah. there and there were extras that were in the movie that are still there playing like the ghost baseball players and they were out there and there was bags set up. And I remember like Keegan Thompson and Michael Rucker and uh, Eric Ullman were playing bags and like, you know, Drew Smiley was sitting on the tractor by the house. And I think like Nico Horner said he was on the bench up at the house and like Christopher Morell's in the outfield. And, you know, I know you talked to with Andy for a second, but like Stroman's taking photos as they're going through the corn. Like there was just so many aspects and everybody was spread out as to what you envision like this, the movie site, that because that's what it is. And we were on the outfield and people were in the infield or up by the house. It was just incredible overall. Yeah. And to that point, you know, you mentioned like, you know, so it's easy to forget that, you know, the, these guys are, are baseball fans too, right? You know, that that, that Marcus Stroman and, and, and Drew Smiley and Nico Horner, like all these guys love baseball, like you and I and anyone listening. Uh, and so for them to be there and, and to, to be taking photos, you know, it's rare that we get to see them in that that element where they're they're such fans and enjoying the moment. And, and you know, uh, I saw a lot of guys afterwards on social media taking selfies with like Johnny Bench or, or Billy Williams or Ken Griffey. I think Nelson Velasquez posted a picture that he like, I mean, he looked like a little kid. You wouldn't have thought that he would have been uh, so excited meeting Ken Griffey Jr. when he's a big leaguer himself. But, you know, it was just a special moment to see that and, and for them to, you know, experience something that is really, you know, you know, very unique and very rare. And it's not coming back next year. So who knows, you know, when when they'll ever get the opportunity to, 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 to play there again. And, you know, it, it was just super incredible to, to see them. Uh, enjoying the field like everyone else you know I, you know I think our first time when we were on the field uh, we we walked to the movie set and we were just taking soaking it all in and that's what those guys were doing too they were grabbing their phones and going around in a circle capturing video of it all and going live on Instagram whatever they were doing they were they were truly truly enjoying it and, and that's that's what was incredible uh, of seeing the Cubs do it yeah it was and I remember after the game 
Nico Horner was saying that he saw he could visibly see a horse from playing, yeah. you know, his position at shortstop, which I thought was wild because I didn't see a horse the whole time. So I don't yeah. know if Nico was seeing ghost horses in the corn or something. <laughs> like that, but like, but I know there was there was rumors of like Clydesdale being around. Um, but either way, like just the fact that like Nico compared it to a college venue and being able to see a horse, like normally, yeah. you know, imagine like being in Wrigley Field or an MLB stadium, even a minor league stadium. Like those things are so packed with people around you that yeah. like you're not going to see outside of it. And um, that was incredible. And Seiya Suzuki was saying he's never seen a cornfield like that in his whole yeah. life. Which I get, you know, Carlos he, Morales, or excuse me, Christopher Morales said something similar too, where, you know, he's like, he's like, I never, I used to watch the movie millions of times growing up and I never thought I'd be coming out of a, a cornfield kind of like the, uh, like the, they did in the movie. Yeah, for sure. And, and that was just, I don't know how else to explain it. Like, it was just so cool. Like, yeah. and, you know, and I guess I was, I've been surprised last year and this year, I don't know much about agriculture, but like that the corn's that high in like early, mid August, I thought was kind yeah. of interesting too, that you can't, I mean, it's taller than us and it was right. throughout the whole thing, but yeah, walking the path in the daytime and then in the nighttime and, and seeing, you know, the players like go through and just seeing how giddy all the players were like. I, I think like you mentioned that Andy, I thought that was really cool. And and a lot of these guys had either seen the movie or not seen the movie. And um, you know, like I was saying too, about say he ended up playing catch in that moment where everybody was out there. He was playing catch with one of the extras from the film, one of the guys who was like the background baseball players for the white Sox. So um, yeah, I just thought, you know, all around just very, very cool. Uh, 10 out of 10 would recommend if the Cubs were ever there again. Yeah, if you have the chance, go. And and I'll add one quick thing too. You know, it, it, there was so much going on. If 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 you're listening, you 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 would you kind of forget that there was a game going on because uh, we we briefly only briefly touched on on you know yeah. the, the game itself. But uh, that was a good. Uh, I asked Ian Hep after the game. I said, Hey, well, you know, does this kind of you've been in playoff games? Does this kind of uh, you know have the atmosphere? Obviously, it's not the the high stress of a playoff game, but the atmosphere with everything going around around it. And he's like, yeah, you know, I, I I talked to the rest of the players and said, hey guys, there's one batting cage here. You know, we've got a lot of stuff going on pregame. Make sure you get your work in. And 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 you know that was what was you know another thing that that might slightly get overlooked, but but it, you know the that's a good for a young Cubs team. That's something that's very helpful going through you know kind of a crazy chaotic day with all the travel and everything going on pregame to then go out there and play a game and and perform like they did was was a good experience for them too yeah it was and I I think one of the things that we heard Andy a lot I know you asked you know David Ross and stuff about this as well but just like what the field looks like and it being like a major league field and Rossi was saying like yeah he wanted like run out there onto the field Um, but Nico commented like unprompted about how awesome a condi- of a condition the yeah. field was in and uh cole Wright and cliff floyd actually earlier in the week got to catch up with the re- the field of dreams groundskeeper murray cook so uh let's take a listen to that right now and hear how he prepped the field for this event all right gang when it comes to pristine playing surfaces uh, this right here in dyersville iowa field of dreams may be one of the best in all of major league baseball and the man responsible uh, this gentleman right here murray cook and murray well your title it's a long winding one so i'll let you <laughs> tell everybody at home what it actually entails no, i'm president of a brightview sports turf division and been major league baseball's field consultant for uh, 30 years okay now when it comes to putting all this together the spectacle going down on thursday night cubs and reds how does everything come together when it comes to crossing T's and dot and I's, at least for you and your crew? Oh man, we've started this thing back in 2019 when we built it and each year we come out and get ready for this game and and we, we start, you know, probably there in June putting all the seats and bleachers and all. I mean, it's it's a very choreographed group. We've got a great team with BAM and Populous and our Brightview Club come in here and pull the scene together. A lot of work, mm-hmm. a lot of time, but just filled of dreams. you got to make it work. Absolutely. And you've been uh, working with Major League Baseball for decades now, and you've known this guy off to your left for quite some time as well? That I have. Okay. <laughs> well, he, he, he wouldn't know that. See, he didn't listen to me earlier, Murray. <laughs> Knowing all the stuff that I know about you, <laughs> going back to West Palm Beach, yeah. right? Uh, tell him about what goes into like the preparation of getting the grass. Cause we talked about the snaking of the grass and the outfield and so on and so forth. Yeah. But yeah. just talk about the different types of grass. You know, there's obviously there, there's a cool season grasses, warm season grasses, Bermuda's in the south, bluegrass is in the north. And there's a transition zone, makes it tough to grow grass. So there's there's balances in both. And we really look at this field here as a bluegrass field. We're up far in the north okay. and it's a, it, it's a grass that I know most major league guys prefer is this bluegrass. 
So this this one does not snake as much. No, sir, it doesn't. Especially when you mow it right. When you mow it right, you don't you cross up the patterns. You don't get that snaky feel on the outfield, and you're ready to go. Okay, for everyone at home who's sitting there and talking about snakes, are you talking about actual <laughs> uh, serpents out there in, in the corn? Explain to everybody at home what it means when an outfield grass is going to snake. Okay, so what happens is the ball comes towards you, hit pretty hard, and it got the it's a ground ball, and the ball kind of skips to left or right you'll know that there's a grooving pattern been put into the grass that causes it to kind of make that little little jig to one side or the other, which makes it pretty tough for the guy to pick it up in the outfield. Okay. So I would tell everybody this, you're a busy man. Mm -hmm. You got stuff going on. They got a game tonight. Yep. They got a game, obviously, the uh, yeah. big game is, is, is Thursday night. Yeah. Just talk about tonight's game and then getting ready for Thursday. Tonight's game's been great. You know, my league, we get the kids out here to, to check out this field. You know, it's, it's good to show them the new – the future of baseball out here to see what's going on. Got a full house coming in tonight. And then uh, Thursday night, you know, you know, Cubs Reds, we're excited for those guys to see the site. You know, I always love watching people come into the site and look at this, just watching their face. The players come out and just see it, and they, they get this really big look in their eyes like, oh, my gosh, we're in the middle of a cornfield. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sounds corny, but it is what it is. I'm Cornelius, so yeah. it definitely sounds corny. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, Murray, when it comes to some of the challenges, you don't get to dig your hooks into this ball field until June, like you said. So not being able to survey everything and, and have you know your hands 100% on everything from front to back, a little bit different and a little bit challenging. So what are some of the things that spring up? You know what? Weather's always one, right? So we're always looking at weather. We got a great couple of days of weather here. Looks good for Thursday too. A little sprinkles in the morning, maybe. So the next two days are good. But when we start cranking this thing up, as far as growing it out of dormancy, we're starting back in like in April, right? So we're taking care of this thing year round, really. We got to protect it during the winter time. Got to cover it up with a big blanket to keep it warm during the winter. Iowa got some snowstorms. They got oh. a lot of snow. It gets pretty cold up here. But uh, we got a great partners with the John Deere folks and their guys that help us with the with their products here on the field. Got everything we need to make it work. Now, how do you keep it so green? I mean, look, my, my grass in Florida ain't green, but you talked about the different, you know, um, climates and so on and so forth. But this is uh, this is different. Yeah, you know what? We we have a very aggressive fertilization program that we that we've been using, and and we got to. It's like anything. We don't want to peak it to the point that we have, you know, right. we're here for, for two games and we're gone. So we, it's, it's a lot of product materials put on here and got a great crew, got a great team, couldn't do it without them. Our Right View Club is, is here helping us out. We got a, a ton of guys from Iowa here helping us out with the project. It's, uh, they just come out and of course, there's always the corn. Yeah. We got to grow that too. Yes, yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Yeah, and the tassels coming into full bloom, no doubt about that. But as long as you've known Cliff, or what do you say, if you put Cliff out here today, Maybe tomorrow, maybe Thursday. How do you think he'd fare out there on the field? I, I, he would. He wouldn't make an error. I know that. It won't be the field's fault. <laughs> All right. Cliff would play a That's clean Indian. game defensively. Well, you, you've known him for quite some time, so you paid him yeah. to do that. I saw Long you exchange time. a few dollars before. Yeah, he doesn't here. age. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> well. Well, Murray Cook, good stuff. Uh, hopefully everything is going to be on the up and up once game time rolls around. And like yeah. you said, when fans walk in here, you're going to see the excitement all over their face and uh, the excitement well-deserved for you. Job Thank well you. done. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Thanks Murray. Thanks, Thanks buddy. See you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank Thanks. you. We know you love Chicago. You devour the pizza, admire Chicago's skyline, and cheer on Chicago sports teams, especially the Cubs. If you wanted to live in a more boring place, you'd live in St. Louis. Why not bank with Chicago's bank too? Upgrade your wallet with an exclusive Wintrust Cubs debit card, which you can get when you open a Wintrust Cubs checking account. Show your Cubs pride and open an account at Wintrust.com slash Cubs. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. All right, welcome back to the Cubs Weekly Podcast. So feel the dreams that's in the rearview mirror now for the Cubs it turns to their next, you know, they turn their attention in the next six weeks or so of the season. But actually, even just in the days leading up to feel the dreams and the Cubs trip to Iowa, we had some really interesting news. Uh, you know, first up, I guess, Jed Hoyer spoke to the media and I was there at Wrigley Field as he talked about the end for Jason Hayward in a Cubs uniform. Um, it, the Cubs will part ways with Hayward after the 2022 season. He is injured now. Uh, he might be added a 60 day IL at some point in the future. We're not a hundred percent sure, but he's just not rebounding from the right knee injury that has really kind of plagued him all year, but particularly over the last month, month and a half. Um, so there's, there's not a guarantee that he's going to be out all year, but most likely will not see the field again this year. And then after the season, the Cubs have already informed him that they will move on. And uh, even though he has one year left in his contract, they'll let him go about uh, free agency and try to catch on with another opportunity somewhere else. So, um, yeah, I, I, Indy, I mean, that was surprising. I think it's something that 
Cubs fans have asked about, and I think rightfully so, you know, just given Hayward's production level and, and Jed Hoyer was very honest in talking about it. Um, and it's, it's difficult anytime this happens with a player, you know, on an eight year contract and, and they're kind of parting ways after seven years. I think it's also difficult for a guy because he was a huge part. And as Jed Hoyer said, like an emotional leader of that 2016 team that ended this curse and ended the 108 year drought and all of the things that meant so much to Cubs fans. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, you know, I think it means a lot. And, and that was a big topic of conversation with a lot of players, what Seiya Suzuki learned from Hayward, what, you know, how, how Hayward helped Nico Horner learn to be a pro and learn to be a leader. And Ian Happ has shouted out Hayward before and all this stuff. But, you know, I think any, when you, when you heard that, I know you were in Iowa going ahead of the field of dreams and stuff, but like, you heard him, we were talking about it. Just what was your maybe first reaction to the Hayward news? And and what do you think you'll remember most about Hayward's time with the Cubs here in Chicago? Yeah, it was definitely, like you mentioned, it was definitely surprising, but at the same time, um, you know, not entirely unexpected, as you kind of alluded to, just given, you know, the circumstances of what had gone around it. Um, I guess more so it was surprising that it, it, it kind of felt like, you know, it was almost out of the blue in a lot of sense. And, and that was what was most shocking to me. But, you know, this is a guy who, you know, you ask, you talk to anyone in, in the Cubs clubhouse and they immediately will mention Jason Hayward as a leader in the, in the clubhouse, as a, as a guy who's influenced them. Alec Mills, you know, has mentioned, you know, when he first got to the Cubs from Kansas City, he knew no one in the organization. It was a little daunting for him, you know, and, you know, you think about it, like if you start a new job and you don't know anyone, it's a little like, oh my gosh, like, you know, like, what's it going to be like? I have, I don't know anyone. I don't know anything about this place. Uh, Jason Hayward reached out right away. We saw that last year with Jack Peterson when he signed. The first person that gave him a phone call was Jason Hayward. There's little things like that that, you know, aren't always talked about or, or maybe get overlooked that Jason Hayward kind of did. Uh, and he was just that that emotional leader, or that, that clubhouse leader. And, you know, it, it, it's, you know, a huge it, it, the culture that's been set that they always that that David Ross and the Cubs always talk about, you know, creating a winning culture. Mm -hmm. Jason Hayward played a big part in creating or creating and establishing that. Uh, and, and then obviously, you know, you think back to, to some of his moments, uh, there's, you can't you can't talk about Jason's Jason Hayward's tenure without talking about the 2016 World Series and the speech uh, during the 17 minute rain delay. I mean, it, it, it's it, he's done so much for this team. Uh, whether it's on the field or behind the scenes that, you know, easily gets overlooked. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's a little shocking given the timing, but at the same time, like you mentioned, just with, with how uh, it's, it's gone over the last year or two, it's, it's not entirely uh, unexpected. Yeah, no, it's not for sure. Um, you know, and I think it's um, his, you know, like the ripple effect from his impact on the clubhouse, like the fingerprints, if you will, will, yeah. will be around, the team for a while, you know, I think a lot of who Nico Horner and Ian Happ are, for example, you know, is because of Jason Hayward, like Nico yeah. worked out with Hayward in several off seasons over the last couple of years. And, you know, as two of the only guys who are in Chicago and we see what Hayward's impact is in the community, you touched on a little bit too, but like just the, the facility that he's building in North Austin in Chicago, that multi-million dollar, like gigantic facility that's going to be amazing for, for, you know, the youth in the city and then, you know, in the surrounding area. So, um, yeah, his impact will obviously be felt in Chicago for a very, very long time. Um, and especially with that facility, you know, maybe even forever moving forward. So, um, definitely tough. I'm sure it was obviously a very tough conversation for Jed Hoyer and David Ross, who played with Jason Hayward back in Atlanta, even before here. So tough conversations for sure. But, um, you know, switching gear a little bit here, gears a little bit here. I think for me, Reyes was a really interesting move this week where, the Cubs picked him up off waivers. Cleveland had designated him for assignment over the weekend. And, you know, the Cubs took an opportunity and it cost them nothing, you know, just whatever the prorated version of his salary, a little more than a million dollars over the, the final two months of the season. But I thought this was a great move. It was like one of those that was uh, it was out there. And I saw so many Cubs fans right away. Like this makes this makes a ton of sense for the Cubs. And I had a couple of friends who are fans that reached out that are like, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Or is there a possibility that, the Cubs will sign Reyes. And I was like, yeah, I mean, it does make a lot of sense. So it's funny, like there's so often those no brainer moves don't necessarily come to reality. Cause right. like, they're just, you know, like it's just a bunch of like fans or a bunch of baseball fans or a bunch of people like who aren't in the inner workings. But that's exactly what happened here because even Jed Hoyer was saying it, it was like, in a way it was kind of a no brainer. Like the Cubs need more pop and power 
potential at the very least in their lineup. And this is a guy who hit 37 homers two years ago, uh, or sorry, last year, and then 30 homers three years ago. You know, like this is this is a guy that like can hit the ball out of the ballpark, can help score quickly, and it's an, an element of the Cubs lineup that they just don't quite have. So, you know, why not take a chance on a guy who, if if it works out well in this seven or eight week audition, then they have two years of control left on him. So I thought it was definitely a no brainer. And, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what the next few weeks, especially are play out for, for Reyes. Yeah. And that's immediately when, you know, when he was designated for assignment by Cleveland, you know, I was like, wow, that would like, if, 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 if he is available, that would be the perfect fit for, for the Cubs, uh, you know, just, given what he can produce, you know, just a few seasons ago, he had 37 home runs. He's hit 30, he's at 27. Uh, you know, he's, he's the master of the ball and, you know, obviously had a, a slow start in Cleveland and Cleveland's in a, in a playoff race, right. They couldn't wait for him to, to get it going. They couldn't just sit around and think, you know, you know, he'll get it going. Like, let's, let's keep trotting him out there. Like, no, they, they, they can't have a, a bat that, that wasn't performing to the, what they were hoping, so they had to cut loose. They had to cut him loose. And and for the Cubs, who have patience, who have time, who who have at bats to to, to give uh, Fran Mel Reyes, it, it makes no. It's a no brainer for for two months. And if he had, you know, if he has anywhere near the kind of success he had, you know, just a few seasons ago, you know, it might tr- turn out to be one of those shrewd moves that that Jed Hoyer and the Cubs pull off. We saw what guys like Frank Schwindel and Patrick Wisdom and Rafael Ortega did last season with with a couple months of of uh, even Ian Happ of uh, with a couple months of, of of playing time and you know Fran Mel Reyes can catch on. He's also a guy that's a really good clubhouse presence from from you know I've heard from other people in San Diego. You know he was a great clubhouse leader for for San Diego and when he left, you know the, it felt that they felt it in the the the, the Padre uh, clubhouse. Uh, when you think about it, you know some of the young guys like Nelson Velasquez and and Christopher Morel already hitting it off with friend mill it, it's a no it was a no-brainer and and i think it, it didn't hurt and it, it could greatly benefit the cubs not only for this year like you mentioned but moving forward with a couple of years of cl- club control yeah and i think too like we said the element of, of power that he can bring I, I think that was something that jed hoyer and we'll hear from him in a bit but you know in his conversation with cole wright on cubs live last week like one of the things this was before the rays move one of the things that Hoyer called out was just power. Like the team, this team, this iteration of the offense, hitting the ball on the ground too much and they're grounding into too many double plays. And so while they're getting on base at a, at a you know pretty good clip and they are getting a decent amount of hits and stuff like that, they just need more power. They need that instant offense. And, um, you know, so obviously Reyes can impact that, but I think the Cubs will be searching for that this winter as well. I think, uh, you know, we've we've heard Jed's comments several times over the last week, and then Tom Ricketts released a statement on Thursday just about what the Cubs are going to do this offseason, I think. And and I thought it was you know really telling. Like he said, I'll be the first to acknowledge this is not the type of baseball Cubs fans deserve. And, you know, he talked a little bit about obviously how difficult last trade deadline was, but he also talked about hope and and uh, the optimism for the future and and how they how he feels like he's making progress and I'm sorry the Cubs are making progress up and down the system you know whether it's it's the the prospects in the farm system or at the big league level and he loves he lauded David Ross's ability to have the team fighting hard and he also talked about you know just making sure that they're going to be active this offseason competing in the free agent market and Jed Hoyer said the same thing I expect to be aggressive this winter like there's no question we'll have money to spend. And so um, it, it, in a way, it's a little bit of a no brainer, right? Like there are a lot of, uh, there are, a de- it's a pretty decent free agent class, especially for really, really, really good shortstops out there as well. But, um, you know, some pitchers, some relievers, some other guys like Brandon Nimmo in the outfield that could be really good fits for the Cubs, but just in general, there's not this roster we look at, and there's a good amount of players and it, it's difficult right now for David Ross to kind of find playing time but there's not a lot of guys who are like entrenched in spots that need to be here and are definitely a part of the core moving forward. So adding impact talent, it is a no brainer. And and we saw it last year with the Cubs adding Seiya Suzuki and Marcus Stroman. But to me, you know, I, I did, I, you know, I think a lot of Cubs fans enjoyed hearing that. Um, obviously the Cubs, you know, we'll have to go out and do it this off season and we'll see how it plays out. But Definitely right now to, to say that they're planning on being very active in free agency with money to spend, I think is exactly what Cubs fans want to hear. 
Yeah, that's that's definitely the case. And and you mentioned it, you know, there's also great starting pitching, right? You know, um, Carter Hawkins mentioned it last week in St. Louis, you know, there's a premium on, on starting or on pitching in general. And, you know, that's kind of what we saw with the draft and and and, and the trades that they made at the at the deadline, a lot of pitching. Um, some some big names will be available like Taewon Walker and, and uh, J- potentially Jacob DeGrom, other guys like that uh, that'll be available in the free agent market. So it makes sense that that, that they're going to be there. And, you know, it, like like you mentioned, it, they've shown it the last two years that they have they will go out. Someone like Marcus Stroman, who has been pitching really well as of late, and, and someone like Seiya Suzuki, who, who we've seen the flashes of, of what he could be in the major leagues as he adapts to this this brand new league that he's never played in before uh it it just makes a ton of sense and the infrastructure like you like you touched on too is 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 showing a lot of science i mean the the ability that you can develop someone like scott efros and then trade him for a starting pitching prospect that is very highly regarded speaks to the volumes of what the cubs feel about their pitching infrastructure and then there's belief in it when you see all the acquisition of of pitching when you see justin Steele and, and keegan thompson come in and prove that they can be big league uh, big league pitch starting pitchers that can get out. Uh, it, it's it 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 just shows the the infrastructure uh, that they that they feel like they have that and that could they feel like they can be successful with. Yeah, so you know we teased this Jed interview, but let's listen to him now. He talks a little bit about the off season, his plans and and his approach, and then just you know about some prospects in the system and what he's going to be keeping an eye on over the final two months of the season. Yeah, you know, we'll certainly have money to spend uh, going into next year. And um, you know, we, our, our goal is to, to build something really special. Uh, we know um, that that truly special season uh, may mm-hmm. be a bit in the future, um, but we want to compete every year uh, in the meantime. So there'll be money to spend, and um, we look forward to, to getting to the off season and, and working on that. But in the meantime, we got uh, a lot more games, and uh, we can learn a lot over this uh, this next, you know, almost two months. Okay, so when it comes to some of those holes that need to be plugged, I know you're not going to go into specifics with certain players, but are, are there any needs in particular when it comes to positional places? Uh, is it a shortstop? Is it a second baseman, center field, catcher for that matter? Yeah, it's hard to say that because I don't okay. want to um, – we still, we're still playing games and we got exactly. guys on the field. Um, you know, but certainly we, we know what things we need to address. You know, I think this year uh, we put the ball on the ground way too often. We've gotten on base – We've done a good job of grinding at bats, but like kind of finish, finishing off rallies with too many double plays, uh, you know, not enough, not enough power in, in some ways. So those are some things we have to address. Uh, and certainly pitching depth. We worked really hard at the deadline. We worked hard in the offseason to, uh, to do that. But I think when we've really hit the skids this year at, at a couple of different times, it's been lack of pitching depth. And we just have to keep building that up. Uh, the system is about to start churning out some really good pitching. Yeah. Um, but we have to be aware, like, you know, we saw this year what happens when you don't have enough pitching. Uh, we had, you know, four starters on the IL, and we weren't able to uh, uh, to perform when we had that. So we have to avoid that going forward. Jared, we saw you deal three relievers for three right-handed pitchers with tons of promise. You take a look at Ben Brown, Saul Gonzalez, Hayden Wesneski. How encouraged are you by the haul that you were able to pull in? Yeah, you know, I think we the draft, we took a lot of pitching. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got a lot of pitching at the deadline. Uh, we've been just, as an organization, really trying to turn out pitching uh, you know, internationally, you know, through the draft, through trades, through free agency. Um, we feel really good about our pitching infrastructure led by Craig Breslow. Sure. Um, those guys have done a wonderful job, and uh, I think that the fruits of those labors are going to start showing up really soon. When it comes to the guys that you were taking in the draft, uh, seventh and 47th, two big-time irons, how do you feel about those youngsters? Yeah, fantastic. You know, we're going to take it slow this summer with them. They've had, they've had big seasons, but, you know, in our opinion, we, we got someone that we felt like was the best college pitcher at the end of the year in Cade Horton. Uh, we got a guy that we had rated as one of the top high school pitchers in Jackson Ferris. Sure. And um, it was important. You have to, you have to be willing to, to take shots on, on, on really good power arms in the draft. And uh, we did that, and we couldn't be more excited about it. Jed, Saturday before the trade deadline, you dealt Chris Martin to Los Angeles for Zach McKinstry. What was it about McKinstry that you liked to bring him into this club? Yeah, we love the versatility. Okay. Uh, left-handed bat was really important for us. You know, we were pretty right-handed. Uh, he was a guy we had targeted for a while. Uh, the Dodgers are so deep. Uh, especially in the infield, and there wasn't a lot of playing time for him. So sometimes you can take a, a good player out of a situation where he doesn't have a lot of playing time. Um, he can really uh, allow his, his career to sort of be unlocked. And so we're hoping here he has opportunity, and we can hopefully he can make the most of that opportunity. It doesn't hurt that he's a Fort Wayne, Indiana native, and he grew yeah. up coming to Wrigley Field yeah. watching Cubs games. That certainly helps, no doubt about that. How about the future of the Cubs when it comes to some of these youngsters, Kevin Alcantara, PCA, and Matt Mervis? This guy, tons of power right now. You have to feel pretty good about the way things are looking down on the farm. 
Yeah, I feel great about the way things are going. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're winning tons of games. I think we're third in the minor league in winning percentage. Uh, our prospects are, are playing really well. Um, up and down the system, we have a lot of depth. And um, I think that, you know, that'll start to come up. You know, if, if year after year we can you know, have good drafts, develop well, um, that will that will eventually you know, matriculate its way up to the big leagues and, and, and have a huge impact. This year, uh, we didn't quite have that you know that 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 level to come up to the big leagues and help in the way we will in the future. Um, but I think pretty soon it'll be the way it was, going back to 2013, 14, 15, where every year there were multiple players coming up to the big leagues and, and making a huge impact. And you know people should be excited to watch um, you know, watch the minor leagues right now. Yeah, plenty of excitement on the back burner right now. And you talk about the third best record in the minor leagues. So Jed, when it comes to that window for the next great Cubs team, oh, when will that next championship trophy be hoisted? You don't necessarily know that, but you talk a look at that promise and uh, these guys right here, they're setting the world on fire. Yeah, you know, I never put an exact date on it, yeah. but uh, we're, we're getting really excited about the way things are coming together in the minors. Um, I always tell people that, you know, long before sort of people started to figure out that we had that much talent in the minors in 2014. It's sort of the end of 14 is when people start talking about the minor league system. Mm -hmm. And we knew kind of well in advance of that. And so I'm starting to get that feeling now as well, where you know, we have a ton of talent. These guys are all performing. And uh, yeah, I think pretty soon um, everyone will start to realize just how much you know, ability we have in the minors. And, and now it's about um, that transition. You know, when, when you get to that point, it's about transitioning to, to being a championship team. And you know, we did did that exceptionally well uh, in 2015, and that'll be that'll be our challenge to to get to that point. You know, you have to gather those gather that talent in the minor leagues, but then that transition to to make sure that you can win in the big leagues is is really important. And uh, we've done it before, and we'll do it again. Minor league talent at the catcher position. What's it looking like right now? Because uh, all indications show it's uh, pretty positive. Yeah, you know, Miguel Amaya is on the way back. Yep. Um, he looks really good. He's he's DHing for us mm -hmm. in uh, in Tennessee, hitting really well. Um, he's on a throwing program, so he's not going to catch right now. But you know, hopefully, when we get to this fall and into the winter, he'll start those drills and um, come back good as new. So, um, you know, in some ways, I feel like we've uh, had a great um, year in the minors, and you know, some of our, our main guys like Brandon Davis and, and Miguel Maya have been hurt. And uh, those guys are going to come back really strong. Yeah, with guys that used to be in the minors like Nelson Velasquez and Christopher Morel, how promising are their early starts to their career in the bigs? Because uh, what we've seen out of them in a small sample size looks pretty good. Yeah, I love their energy. Absolutely. And they play hard every day. They, ha they, have, they have real tools. And, you know, I think that you're going to see with them, you're going to see some inconsistencies, as you see with young players. Um, but you can see the talent. And I think that's the most important thing. And they're, they're both just great kids. Yeah, two more talented guys. Uh, they're in that rotation. Justin Steele, of course, Keegan Thompson. When it comes to these guys being pillars of that rotation, is this something that you see for years to come? Yeah, they look great. They do. Um, you know, I think for us, you know, it's about um, this next two months, kind of monitoring their workload a little bit, making sure that, they don't get overtired. Uh, they're, you know, they're a big part of part of the future, and we have to make sure that uh, we, we handle them the right way. Um, but it's been really exciting to to see them, and I think you've seen the same thing. There's some inconsistency there from start to start, but. Um, you know when they're on, when they're when they look right. Uh, these guys look like uh, le like legitimate big league starting pitchers that can help us win a lot of games. Just a shade over 100 games. That means that you're just under 60 for the season. So what do you want to see out of this team towards the back half of the season, man? Yeah, you know I think uh, we'll have a lot of opportunity for guys to play to, to show different things. Want to put guys in different positions okay. uh, to succeed. You know I think the bullpen. Obviously we traded four relievers and. And that's going to be something we're going to have to piece together the rest of the way. I know that, and that's sort of on me, that we love the talent we got for those relievers for our future. But obviously that's a hole that we're going to have to fill, and we're not going to be able to fill it the rest of the year with guys like you know, David Robertson and Gibbons. And, you know, uh, that, that, that's going to be the, the challenge. But it, it, Is it the time for some of those youngsters to assume that role? Yeah. Because sometimes before you can become a starter, what you want to be, you have to really prove your worth and cut your teeth as a reliever. I love breaking – Starters and as relievers, okay. I think that they realize they can, you know, they can get major league outs. I think that they can, um, they realize they can hold their stuff a little bit longer than sometimes they think. So a lot of really good uh, starting pitchers, Keegan and Steele, as an example, have, have started that way. Absolutely. Um, so that's really important. And like, look at Scott Efros last year. He came up uh, in August after we traded guys away, made a huge impression, and then was, was fantastic this year. And obviously, you know, it wasn't something we talked about a lot before, but you know, we we had a deal to turn him into a, a guy that we think can be a really good starting pitcher for us for a long time. So um, it's a great opportunity for you guys to show what they can do.
Yeah, the future, it's always an unknown, but it always helps to have a little extra insight from one of the guys that makes the decisions. President of Baseball Operations for the Chicago Cubs, Jed Hoyer. Jed, always a pleasure catching up with you. And now you can relax just a little bit because the trade deadline and all the moving and shaking, it's over with, at least until next season. Yeah, the, the, the mind never stops. You're, okay. always, you're always on to the next thing, but um, it's nice not to be up at 2 a.m. every night. Absolutely. Jed Hoyer, always a pleasure. Thanks, Cole. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks. All right, that'll do it for this week's edition of the Cubs Weekly Podcast. Make sure to tune in next week. We're going to talk all things farm system with Lance Brazdowski. He's going to have an updated prospect rankings list out very soon, and we'll have him on to chat it through and explain some of the reasoning, especially with some of the new guys like uh, you know number seven overall draft pick, Cade Horton, where they slot in the overall system. We appreciate you tuning in to this edition of the Cubs Weekly Podcast. As always, we are sponsored by Wintrust. Don't forget to download and subscribe to the pod on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And check us out in video form on the Marquee Sports Network app and YouTube. For Andy, I'm Tony. We'll catch you next time.